Welcome to the Payday with Ray Ray podcast, hosted by yours truly, Rachel Bell. I'm here to make your life easier as an entrepreneur and teach you everything I've learned about building multiple seven-figure online businesses. And on this podcast, I'll be giving you my best advice, trainings, and mindset shifts so you can grow your business and most importantly, make every day your payday. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Payday with Ray Ray, Bay Bay. It's Ray Ray, your host, and I'm joined today by a very special guest. He is my right-hand man inside of my business, and I'm so excited for you to get to know him, but we are going to recap this entire launch that we just came out of. Over the past 33 days, we have been launching our faces off (laughs) for Online Coach Accelerator, which if you followed me for 0.5 seconds, you already know that is my signature 90-day business mentorship program for online coaches who want to scale their businesses to six figures and beyond. So it's been real and... It's been a month. It's been a month. Yeah, I think so. It's, <laughs> that is a nice way to put it. It's actually been like one of the easiest and best and the biggest launches we've ever had. I actually wanted to take a moment to just sit down, share some real numbers with you guys about what we were able to bring in. What were we be able to create? The team that we onboarded, the team that was supporting us and give you a background look into what does the behind the scenes even look like? Because all you guys saw was the Instagram stories of me promoting. But I know that you guys are all business owners as well. You're looking at the promotions from the external, but you're probably wondering what's going on on the inside as well. Oh, there's no internal. It's all just just front facing. (laughs) Instagram is real life. You guys didn't know. Come on. But it's it's pretty far away from real life. There's a lot of things that go wrong during the launch. There's a lot of things that go right. And so we just wanted to level with you and show you the behind the scenes and what was broken about the launches in the past, what we fixed and how it was able to pay off. So yeah. So just to start off, our goal going into this launch was to at least double the launch volume that we were able to bring in in past rounds. The past couple launches we've been launching, we have brought in 114 students and 119 students the past two times. This launch was very different. We were able to significantly increase the amount of students that were able to jump into the program and felt called to join us. And because of that, this has been the biggest launch to date with over $870,000 in sales over 30 Mm -hmm. days. So far. So far. And we're not really done yet. We still have a few days left of students enrolling and taking up the last few spots, but that is crazy. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's been a wild ride for a month and it's, Honestly, wouldn't have it any other way. So much fun. It's been a lot of fun. Also, I share these numbers because three years ago, back in 2017, I could not imagine bringing in that amount of income and really what what I view it as is trust. Like that amount of people trusting this program to Mm -hmm. get results and taking the leap. I don't take it very lightly. And I couldn't imagine making that much in 30 days at any point in my life. In fact, three years ago, at the salary that I was working at in my job, that would have taken me over 28 years <laughs> to achieve. I would have had yeah. to wait 28 years of my life to achieve that much income generation. And now we're able to create that in just 30 days, which is such a blessing, so insane. And I also just wanted to share that I heard an amazing quote probably a couple weeks ago by this lady named Suzanne Evans, who's oh. a business mentor. And she, me and Luke just oh absolutely fell in love with her. Because I, I want her to be my sister or mom. I don't know how, but Susan, <laughs> she, if you're listening. <laughs> Susan, Suzanne, if you're listening, become my relative or something of that like that so I can get closer to you. But yeah, she shared an amazing quote that was year one equals figuring it out. Year two equals working it out. And year three in business equals rocking it out. And that's been insanely true just in my journey now. I'm in year three of this coaching business and we're totally rocking it out. So I wanted to share that for you sounds like a lot to handle, like over 800K in 30 days. It is a lot to handle. But if you just focus on your business and you don't switch ideas every three months, you can create this too. And that's what I want this message to really be. So just to segue into Luke, who I want to introduce you to on a more deep level, as you grow your business, you are going to grow in income. You're going to grow in notoriety. You're going to grow in reputation, audience, all the good stuff. You're also going to grow in team, which means your expenses are going to grow. And in addition to that, your complexity inside of your business is going to grow significantly. And if you do not have like a right hand systems expert beside you, it can easily feel like you're drowning in your own business. You're in like this golden prison that you've built for yourself and you have no way to stay Mm -hmm. in your zone of genius. You have no way to really do what actually lights you up. And because of that, so many entrepreneurs face incredible amounts of burnout and they end up quitting and just burning their entire business to the ground. And I was lucky enough to meet Luke, who Mm -hmm. is my COO, I guess is your official title, but 
we normally refer to him as the Magician. integrator or uh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Magician, alchemist, yeah. Yeah. Interchangeable. Yeah, so, so Luke, he's the magic behind the systems that we run inside of OCU and OCA. And he's responsible for managing the operations, the team. He's ensuring that our profit margins stay strong because as you guys probably can understand, as the team grows, expenses grows, everything grows. So I wanted to tell you guys how me and Luke even met. Oh, we're going into this we're right now? We're going into it. All right. It's a funny story. Basically, the, the first time that we ever met, was through this company called Leverage. Yeah. It was us both virtual assistanting, mm-hmm. helping all these entrepreneurs out in the back end of their businesses. Mm-hmm. I was doing more graphic design, copywriting stuff. Luke was, I mean, what were you doing back then? Yeah. I would think when I started, like that was a long time ago, like I was probably just doing admin work or mm-hmm. something. And I just slowly started like learning new skills and just understanding that. And then I got involved in like the last year, a lot more internally and in building mm-hmm. out sort of uh, the agency side of the company which was so much fun, but also definitely reached burnout. Mm. Yeah. A quick way to uh, hate your life is to start an agency. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, in all seriousness, agencies are probably the most complex business model to Honestly, scale. Honestly, yeah. And just dealing with clients and just keeping them happy. Whew. Yeah. Yeah, you learn a few lessons in there. Yeah, you sure do. But I'm grateful that you had that background because it was able. you were able to join OCU and be like, oh, this is a piece of cake. It's yeah. a coaching business. Yeah. It's much easier. So we met through this company called Leverage. We were both virtual assistants. This is probably like four mm. years ago or something like that. And we never really got close. We just worked together. Outside, you came to New York, though. Yeah, we, yeah I came to New York there. and uh, we smoked a joint together yeah. outside of some hotel. Yep. And that was four years ago. Yeah. And then <laughs> we never spoke again. <laughs> and snap. And now we're here and we're on it. <laughs> but the, the time that we really reconnected was at Burning Man, actually. Mm. We went to Burning Man. Luke had called one of my friends, Amy, and was like, hey, I'm taking a group of humans into Burning Man. We're going to go there and I would just like to invite a couple closer friends and mm. see if you guys are interested in going. We're going to plan it all out and it'll be great. And for some reason, I was just like, yes, like this guy seems like he knows what he's doing. It's so funny because just for context, never have been to Burning Man, but <laughs> I was just so confident off the bat and being like, yeah, I can do this. Like, yeah, yeah, let's just get a whole group of people. I don't even know where it is. Middle of some desert. Hey, you guys want to come? But it, it turned out pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Did it? <laughs> I loved it. I mean, it was the best memory of my life. And at the same time, there were so many fucking issues. It was yeah. so hard to get there. But anyway, we reconnected because of Burning Man. Mm. Shout out Burning Man. Thank you for that experience. We all met up in LA before heading out, got our RVs, and we basically started on a road trip for like what felt like three years, mm-hmm. but really it was probably a little closer to 70 hours. Yeah. You guys had that like 30 foot RV. I was yeah. in a little sprinter RV yeah. leading the way. Yeah, we communicated just through walkie-talkies. That was the best part. Yeah, we would like walkie-talkie through the night. And I remember just to trying to keep awake and asking Luke, like, what is your biggest goal at Burning Man? Yeah, <laughs> hey, what are your intentions going into yeah. this when you're going? Yeah, that was that was great. It was fun. So yeah, we were at Burning Man and basically how the conversation started around him growing OCA and helping me inside of OCU, Online Coach University is I was, we were biking across the desert. I just remember confiding in Luke and telling him about all the issues that I was facing when it came to scaling and honestly, how scared I was to scale my business. Because Mm -hmm. one of the things that's so important to me in my business and that is always going to be important to me is integrity, being able to deliver something that I promise and also intimacy. So making sure that each and every student feels seen, heard, and understood. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I didn't have many role models in my life who were exhibiting both these things at the same time. They were either scaling and kind of sacrificing the intimacy aspect of their programs and just turning it all into self-study courses. Mm -hmm. And just, I didn't want to do that. I wanted it to be so much more. And I remember Luke just saying, well, why don't you do X, Y, Z? It's so funny. I had no intentions behind that. I'm just such a curious person. And it's like, yeah, let's. And I know like you think about it, you go to Burning Man to sort of leave like all your business, your past life at the door. But it's so hard for me to shut off thinking about mm-hmm. these things and asking why. And so I mean, yeah, we were we were biking across the desert. I don't even know for an hour. I don't know. It hours. Just, yeah. Hours <laughs> just going through things. I'm just like, well, why? And we were just like going into it and it was just so much fun yeah. getting to talk into those, those, I don't want to say issues of the time, but just those. Oh, they were issues. Well, no, they were, they were obstacles, the yeah. next things to cross over. 100%. And when you were giving me ideas, it was, it was so clear to me how your outside perspective was so mm-hmm. needed inside of the business, because when you're in your business, you can't clearly see all of the solutions at your fingertips, even though they're right there. And you just need to shift the way that you think about things. Luke was there to illuminate 
some other possibilities for me. So I remember looking up to the stars and being like, dear God, <laughs> please help me manifest Luke onto my team. Amen. <laughs> Left Burning Man one week later, I was out in Rachel's house. And yeah. It's like, all right, let's do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, fast forward. We work together now. Fist bump for that. Boom. Pound it. And it's just been the best time of my life and of my business having Luke on board. So Likewise. thanks for being here, Luke. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, cool. Um, before we dive into the launch recap, yeah. first of all, guys, I, we are not holding back in this episode. We're going to show you everything, the good, the bad, and the mm-hmm. ugly. One of the things I love most about Luke is that he is the logic in mm-hmm. this business. He is the grounded voice of reason and reality. So when you're a visionary, when you have this like creative vision and you're a big giver and you just want to like, man, I want my life to be amazing. I want everyone's life to be amazing. You can get caught up in the dream so much that you don't really check in with the reality of the numbers and what actually yeah. needs to get done to hit those goals. Mm-hmm. Luke does that for me. Data is key. That's, mm. that's my favorite thing to do. And it, it can come off. I love to preface it with just like, I love people. It's like number one for me. But then especially when it comes to business and making decisions, you have to have data on every piece Mm -hmm. and vertical in your business to make the right decisions. And so I love everyone to death, but ultimately I always look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And without the numbers, we can't really support the people. We found so many different gaps in OCA over the years where oh shit, if we were just tracking that one piece of data, we could have helped the student so much more. Or if we were just tracking this one number, I wouldn't have to burn so much money Mm -hmm. on this and I could reinvest in this way. So Luke does that all for me and I'm just so grateful for you. But before we dive into all of the goodies on the logistics of what happened and what went wrong, what went right, I wanted to share first impressions because when you meet someone and you're considering like, you know, hiring them. We're going to do this live on a call right now. Yeah. All right. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't prepared Luke very much for this. So, so yeah, first impressions. I want you to go first. What was the first impression of me? We'll start at Burning Man because you didn't really know me like in New York. Yeah. Okay. So first impression of Burning Man. First impression. I think we met in LA that time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've always stayed in touch with what you've been doing on social media and I've sort of stayed in tune with that, but just reconnecting magnetizing is the word. And I'm not sure what it is. It's certain people have this element, but just you and how you show up was magnetizing. And I could see the attraction to it of people in conversations, how you conduct yourself. And I'm just like, that was really interesting to see Mm -hmm. that. And that was, it's very unique quality as well that I feel a lot of our generation is losing. Mm. So that was my first impression of just like you. And that you could also go into just you were funny, full of laughter, life, like all those great things. But back to it, it's just like magnetizing was the word. Cool. That's a great yeah. first impression. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> I didn't know what you think thought of me. But what I thought of Luke, we had met up in LA before embarking on this Burning Man journey. And my first impression of you was... I wonder if this guy sleeps. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder that too. <laughs> Cause I remember you were, you were just so focused on your work and your craft and mm. like developing what you were doing. And I remember just admiring your work ethic. The first night that we met up, we were heading out very, very early in the morning and you stayed up very, very late working. And I remember I, I had a lot of stuff to do that night yeah, too. Yeah. So we were the only ones up just working away. I remember that moment. Yeah, yeah. In our zones. And then I clocked out and then I think you clocked out shortly after, yeah. but I just remember going to bed being like, wow, Luke is really like a hard worker. He's mm-hmm. not, he's not going to go to bed without closing all the loops, which I really admire about you. Yeah. Which, which all those loops never get closed, I realize. And it was also, yeah, we were going off in the desert for, I don't even know, five, six, six days and no tech, no communication. And at that point I was in running that agency. So it was just like a hundred plus team members in communication with like really just checking over all my SOPs and processes to see, to make sure everything was going to go smoothly. But yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. So that was our first impression of each other. And Now I'm sure that it's a lot more complex and deep than that. I've gotten to know you on such a better level. And yeah, you're just one of my favorite humans that I've ever met. So I'm really grateful that you're in the business. And yeah, you guys are going to love Luke just as much as I do by the end of this episode, because we are going to share the real real. So let's dive into it. Let's dive into it. Business hat on. (laughs) Business hat on. All right. So launch recap. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations to that. us. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a wild month. And um, I wanted to share with you guys what how we did launches in the past and why we decided to completely change the way that we did this launch. Yeah. If you guys saw on stories, you know that I pulled a crazy, crazy ass stunt. 
a lot of people were like, oh, that's cute. What's your plan B? <laughs> when, I <told> them, <laughs> when I told them about the idea, I'm like, there's no plan B. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, but we just are risk takers and yeah. apparently money makers ba- too. Yeah, and based on data, risk yes. based on data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Always yeah. based on data. But what we did in the past to launch OCA is we would open it up for a month of enrollment. We still did that this time. But what we would do before is I had someone who was a sales rep or sales reps on board, and they would just go through basically a sales script on calls. They would guide people through an interview process to see, you know, if the, is this person a good fit? Number one, do they want this? Number two, three, are they ready and willing and able to commit to this? Mm-hmm. And what does that look like for them? And what do we need to walk them through in order to make that happen and to help them make that decision for themselves? So it was all great, but the problems that I was running into was that we had limited team members for this position. I am kind of like a big, I mean, I'm the most, I'm the most of a stickler in this business about Mm. integrity and team and who I want representing this business because for a long time it was just me. And so everything was within my control. So anything that I said in marketing, anything that I said on sales calls, it was all congruent. It was all me. It was all matching the brand. Mm. And Unfortunately, when you bring on your first team members, sometimes you can make the mistake of overlooking the fact that like, are they really the best brand fit? Mm. Most of the time, the answer is absolutely yes, which I'm super grateful for. But there have been a couple of times where I'm like, oh, I should have listened to my gut on this one. It was a quick fix. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a quick fix. Someone who was like ready to jump in. I didn't have the time or capacity to Mm. really vet them as much as I should have. So at some level, it just wasn't the right team member for that role. So What we found through this old launch model was that everyone would do remote sales, which Mm -hmm. means they'd be in their own homes. They would do sales calls. They would get on the phone, walk people through. They also made their own schedule. Yeah. Yeah. They made their own schedule, which means that they could take as many or as few calls as they wanted. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when sales reps are working for, you know, just a month, they want to take as many calls as possible Mm -hmm. because they want to enroll as many students as possible. Mm -hmm. Our number one priority, like I've said a million times before, and this remains true, we get hundreds of calls, hundreds of applications, Mm -hmm. sometimes thousands. And my number one response to every member of the team is we will not enroll anyone who's not actually a perfect fit. But we still get hundreds of people who are good fits. So this means that the sales reps who were in charge were taking way too many calls per day. And that doesn't sound like a problem. But it actually was a big problem for me because I realized that their energy was lacking at the end of the day. If you're Mm -hmm. doing eight calls a day, they're all an hour long Mm -hmm. and you're really going deep with these people. I mean, you just don't have the energetic capacity to handle that. So the close rate was was not good. Yeah, I can Um, can speak. Yeah, yeah, please do. He has the data. Big surprise there. (laughs) But it was it was crazy in that like week one, obviously crazy volume just because there's been so many months of nurture that go on. Mm. But that team, they were closing at like a 37% close rate. And this is two rounds ago? Uh, Yes, two okay. rounds ago. And so they were closing right around 37%. And then this round, just speaking to this and just creating spaciousness with more people, that was up to 51%. Mm. So over half the people closed. And that's insane. Um, And it just goes to show as well, I'll talk about why that change really shifted as well. But one of the things that we realized was that Oh, actually, I sorry. I, I need to interrupt. Yeah. So guys, I take that back. And so what it was actually week one close was 31%. I thought I got the numbers wrong here. And I was like, yeah, it was 31% in week one. And the week one, this launch was 56%. Oh, okay. That's what it was. <laughs> and that's why we have Luke around. Yeah. Update. <laughs> it's just helpful to know. There's a lot of reasons why that happened. But what I wanted to get into was the fact that we came to this conclusion of, oh, our sales reps actually need to take less calls mm-hmm if they want to enroll more students. Mm. And if we want to enroll more students, they need to take less calls so that they have more energy. We found this out through one of our sales reps needed to take time off for family stuff. Yeah, that that was, it was last launch week two. And for me and OCU, it's like when family is number one for every team member and we Mm -hmm. support that in full. And that member at the time needed to take off time to deal with some things and really connect. And her call volume, I believe it yeah, dropped 75%. So she was only doing 25% of that volume. And what had happened was her close rate doubled. And so like that was the trigger being like, whoa, let me get on the phone and ask why and just go into that. And yeah. that was sort of that little initial spark that triggered mm-hmm. it. Yeah. And then also that sales rep was closing at a higher percentage than anyone Mm -hmm. else because she had also been through the program 
before. Mm. So that was another thing that we were looking at. And this is all kind of percolating in our minds as we were watching this unfold. Like, hmm, interesting. Like, there's a lot of different variables here. Mm. But ultimately, it, it makes perfect sense that she's doing the best out of anyone right now because mm. she's taking less calls. She has more energy, more spaciousness. And she's been through the program, so she knows exactly what the potential students are feeling mm-hmm. and what they're facing. So she can be real with them. And, and that was, and it was an honest, great objection we would get on calls as well. So I did some calls last round and they were just like, I just want to speak to someone who's been through the program. Yeah. And, I, and I couldn't give that the, to the people. I'm just like, I can't speak to that. And that was probably one of the biggest objections. And I was just like, oh, she, she never has to deal with that. She's been through it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And so that was powerful. Another thing that went wrong in past launches was that we didn't have any SOPs, which means uh, standard operating procedures. So you'll hear Luke refer to SOP this, SOP that. He's Mm -hmm. referring to the standard operating procedures, which is basically a checklist on what to do in every situation so that Mm -hmm. anyone can fill that role. And it's consistent. Yeah, it's consistency so that everyone's on the same page. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any SOPs. I didn't have any systems really for follow-ups or tracking. So that meant that a lot of students who were interested in the program, unfortunately, with the lack of sales reps to handle that volume. And of course... I couldn't have predicted the fact that we wouldn't have enough sales reps. We always get so much more volume than I expect. Mm -hmm. And so that was a big wake up moment. Like, oh, I need a bigger team. But because of the weak, the weak systems were, you know, failing, the follow-ups wouldn't go out. We wouldn't follow up and check in on people as much as we wanted to, because the team was just so spread then. Yeah. It was, it was only a couple of people and they were just at capacity, just getting on calls and talking. Mm -hmm. It's like they were clocking in doing that. And by the time they clocked out, they were spent. Yeah, And so it it made sense. There's really nothing they could do besides us dropping that volume Mm -hmm. and allowing that time. It's like, this relates back to relationship management. It's like, if I have six friends, which I wish I had six friends, but um, (laughs) if I had six friends, I would energetically be able to give them a really close relationship Mm -hmm. versus if I had 60 friends, Mm -hmm. none of them would probably really like me much because I'd barely be able to send them a text once a month. Yeah, So that's that's the same concept within our our sales team. Exactly. And this is relationship building because what we made in terms of a change for this round is we made sure that every single person who was doing sales has actually been through the program. Mm -hmm. Every single person who was enrolling students is actually helping them on the other side Mm -hmm. and coaching them in some way. So that was a big change that we made as well because it's a relationship at the beginning there. And that's total side note and segue into that. It's like, I would love to see that in the future. And Mm -hmm. it's like, this is more of like the quarterly check-in call with people. And it's like, I would love if the same person who talked to them was able to speak and be like, hey, so how's it going? Looking like looking at their record and yeah. seeing where they were and like checking in and being here to support all these amazing humans. Yeah. Like that's exciting. I know. I I, I geek out on that stuff too. And I absolutely, we have so much yeah, to do. There's, <laughs> there's so much to do. And Luke keeps coming up with all these amazing ideas. And I'm like, ah, one thing at a time. Yeah. But I'm with you. And yeah, the systems were weak. Our follow up was shit, honestly, just mm-hmm. looking back on it now. And and it was the best it could be at that time. But mm-hmm. I'm all about optimization, as you know. So because of all this, my expenses were high. And it was because so many people were falling through the cracks. I couldn't have any predictability with the close mm-hmm. rate because I was like, are people even going to have the energy to have this conversation in mm-hmm. depth with a person who is actually meeting them there? And the experience for the clients just wasn't as optimized as I really wanted and needed it to be for OCA. And I wanted it to be like the first touch that someone has with OCA, the most potent touch. Mm -hmm. Like on that call, it needs to be just truly like, we're here for you. We're supporting you. You have no other people to talk to in your life in an in-depth way about your business and what you're struggling with. This needs to be a safe space. So Mm -hmm. we needed to make sure that all the team was on the same page. But I wanted to pass over the mic to you, Lou, <laughs> and and ask you what the main issues you saw. Because when you, I brought you in, it was like right. October. Mm-hmm. And we went through this whole <laughs> thing where you're like, okay, yeah. Rachel, do you have this? Do you have that? Do you have that? And I was like, nope, nope, nope. And then you're nope. like, launch time. Launch time, let's go. <laughs> and yeah, I learned a lot through that. But yeah. what were the main issues you saw from the old model? Again, issues, I just I look at opportunities. Yes, opportunities, um, I mean. And the opportunities I saw was, I would say, follow-ups. And just really developing a proper follow-up process so that everyone felt heard, seen, and like OSE is all about accountability. Mm. That's what we do. Yes. So if the first touch in the program isn't holding you accountable, it's like, I get it. Like that that needs to be present and forefront. So developing proper follow-ups like uh, this round, I wanted to get as close as we could to build a relationship with our potential students. So 
like the thoughts around that was like Instagram reaching out. Let's, let's talk to people like text them if they ghost on you, like having proper email follow-ups that they could uh, send with ease and also really develop a personal relationship with them. Mm -hmm. So that piece sort of like the real nurture and connection, that was a huge opportunity I saw. The other opportunity was basically having just only alumni Mm -hmm. on the calls. I didn't want anybody to feel like they were being sold or any, anything around that. And I remember we were at Broke to Woke. Can I bring that up now? Or Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was at Broke to Woke. And uh, we were trying just to, we had enrollment open. We were in launch. And so we were like, let's just take people if they want to sign up at the event. And we had these rock star alumni that were there just volunteering their time. And I remember it taking X amount of time for a salesperson on a phone call to try to close someone. And these alumni were just like killing it. They knew exactly <laughs> what they felt, what they yeah. went through. And it was just authentic. Yeah. Like this person was just like, oh, this worked for me. Here's the exact results I yeah. got. It'll work for you too. No you BS. Just take the like, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so so that was another opportunity seeing seeing that. And then outside of that, there's just a lot. I could go into like the system side of it and how like leads are flowing, like the client journey. But mm-hmm. th- there's definitely, uh, there's room there to optimize as well. Yeah. And for the systems nerds out there, another big problem was that I was managing all of the leads Um, And leads is basically languaging for potential clients, people who are interested in OCA and are kind of in the pipeline on their way to Mm -hmm. either accept the offer or deny the offer. And what we were using for that system in the past was ActiveCampaign, which is a customer relationship manager Mm -hmm. software, CRM. Mm -hmm. It was actually what I used to send out emails primarily, but... Somehow we duct taped it together and used it as a pipeline. (laughs) And Luke was looking at that like, oh, this is not robust enough. It's yeah. Here's the thing. Every tool can get you somewhere. And it's just, I I probably play with 10 to 15 systems every few days and just seeing the limitations in it and just, it didn't excite me. Mm -hmm. And so we had swapped over this round to Airtable, which was honestly, if you guys don't know Airtable, check it out. Unbelievable tool. But that just allowed for so much customization and building custom dashboards for each person to give them exactly what they want, view exactly what they needed to see to be able to work efficiently and not be caught up in a bunch of notes on the table and trying to track things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when you deal with hundreds of calls per month, it's so important that you have like records for everything and everyone so that you don't lose track. Oh, Katie was the person who has a dog and she's going mm-hmm. through something right now and blah, blah, blah. I wrote that down somewhere. Where is it? Oh, yeah. It might be on the Google Sheet. It's, yeah. yeah, it's just hard to find when you don't have a system. So this only becomes a problem when you're dealing with a lot of volume. Mm-hmm. And it's that's why it's easy to get away with not having systems when you have a coaching business. Yeah. But if you have plans to scale this bitch, you got to get systems yes. for sure. So enter Broke to Woke. And then mm. at the end of Broke to Woke, Luke turns to me in his floral suit and he oh, says, yeah. Rachel, crazy idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think like, I posed it as a question. Ah. I was like, why aren't the alumni closing people? Yeah. Why aren't the alumni, the people representing this program and like actually yeah. are the people talking to other potential students? Yeah. And I said, ah, good question. <laughs> Let's make that happen someday. But anyway, I didn't know it was going to happen so quickly, but the only reason it was able to be implemented so quickly is because Luke did a tremendous amount of work to put me in my zone of genius mm. on those three months that we were delivering the program. And it was the most successful round of OCA yet. The students were so happy. Everything mm. was amazing. And so we were like, all right, let's do this crazy idea where we have alumni represent mm. this program. But let's not just stop there. No. <laughs> Let's, let's fly them in. Yeah. <laughs> let's fly them in for an entire month. Let's massages, ask Massages, energy work, yes. beautiful villa. Mm-hmm. That was unbelievable. Yeah. But the idea on paper was basically this yeah. OCA camp yeah. where they come in for a three day boot camp where they learn all about how to represent the program, how to navigate mm-hmm. the calls, how to get deep with people and interview them. And then 30 days of calls, six out of seven days a week pretty much from 8 a.m. to around 6 p.m. calls. And we put limitations on how many calls they could have. And we also put limitations on the space that they had in between calls so that there would be no overlap and no rushing. Mm -hmm. So I think each person did anywhere from like maybe three to five calls per day on average. 
So that was the perfect cadence for everyone. It was amazing. But on paper, we were asking people to leave their lives Mm. for an entire month, leave their significant others and their wives and their husbands and come out to this experience to basically represent OCA for a month. Mm -hmm. And it was a big ask. And I didn't know how it was going to go. And I also knew that they were going to be living in a house together for 30 days. So this could go MTV real quick. (laughs) I had no idea. And I kept telling people like, this is either the best idea or the worst idea Mm. I've ever had. And... It was the best idea. Spoiler alert. Yep. But uh, it was it was definitely a risk. It was also yeah. a risk because our fixed costs were a lot higher. Yeah, I remember talking about that. With yeah. Just being like, hey, then yeah, well, the see, I stutter when I start processing. But <laughs> <laughs> I just look at the numbers and be like, I truly felt that it wasn't a risk, but it was the mm. risk with that overhead. But but also, it was just so worth it, and it worked out. Yeah, it was a lot of upfront investment. And in the past, um, we've done basically variable costs where the more that the launch generates, the more the team gets paid, Mm -hmm. which is a really easy way to start. Everybody wins. There's no real risk. But with this model, there was a lot of upfront costs, like, Mm -hmm. you know, up to, you know, 30K for the Airbnb that we Mm -hmm. rented for everything and plus everything else on top of that. Flights, dinners. We had the chef guy. Yeah. Everything, everything, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everything. <laughs> breath work, massages, yeah. like making sure they're taken care of, uh, just whatever. And then partying and yeah. all that stuff. So it was a lot, but we put together this idea and we sent out invitations to around 15 to 20 alumni mm-hmm. who I thought were going to be able to say yes. And I, they were going to be like ride or die. Hell yeah. I'm willing to represent. I want to give up, you know, 30 days of my life to this mission. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, hopefully people like it. And yeah. immediately I got like 10 fuck yeses. Yeah, I am yeah. so in. I had them apply. I did interview calls with them just to make sure they were truly on board for the right reasons. And we ended up with a dream team mm-hmm. of Nick, who you've seen on my Instagram stories. You've seen all of them on my Instagram stories. We ended up with Nick, Flaviano, Mac, Jaren, Anna, and Claire, mm-hmm. and Luke, and me. And me. <laughs> So altogether, it was an absolutely, and Mel obviously yeah, was, was there as well. Like, yeah. yeah, Mel didn't live in the house because she's local to San Diego, but she was still there um, doing calls. It was better than I could have ever expected. Like I said, it was three days of camp, 30 mm-hmm. days of calls, and it was the best idea ever because it ended up being so close to the client journey. And when you get on a call with someone, like we've mentioned before, you want to make sure that they have actually gone through what you've gone through. Mm-hmm. It's a very different conversation to have, you know, an enrollment conversation with someone who doesn't even know what your life is like, yeah. who has never bought this program before. They've never invested in themselves before. And to have everyone actually have been through the program and even be coaches inside of mm-hmm. the program was just, it was mind blowing to watch mm-hmm. the difference in the numbers. Yeah, it was, it was wild. And yeah, it was just the dynamic of that group was just golden, mm-hmm. like everyone's energy and just also be able to give back to them in their own businesses with doing the workshops, little masterminds and everyone left. At least I can speak for myself feeling so full and also just having a bunch of new friends now. So I think I can say I have six friends. You do. I have six friends. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I have six extra friends too, or seven friends, I think. Yes. Yes. (laughs) So yeah, above all else, it was a crazy idea and Mm -hmm. the launch went so well. Honestly, I was kind of bracing myself to handle situations where people in the house weren't going to get along or people would drop out and kind Mm -hmm. of give up. Or I was just bracing myself for anything that could happen because I knew that this is a delicate situation. Mm -hmm. Like I'm really asking for a lot. And it was so amazing to see that everyone there was showing up because they were like, I need to help other people achieve what I've experienced. Mm -hmm. I need to help other people see the solution that is OCA. And I would do anything for this mission. It changed my life. And Mm -hmm. we all did breath work, which is like this. I'll bring Samantha Skelly on the podcast sometime soon to do breath work with you guys. But it's the most transformative personal development modality I know of. And we did breath work together, which is basically just breathing in a lot of emotion, releasing a lot of emotion, and then clarifying what our breakthroughs are. And we all sat in a circle afterwards and just shared kind of our vulnerabilities and what we expected and what we got out of camp. Honestly, I don't think I've felt more bonded, connected, and proud of a group of humans in my entire life. And I'm so grateful that they're all on the team. Yeah, right. That's why I was going to connect to him. Like, wow. Yeah. And they, they all work within OCU now. Yeah. Which is insane. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. It was such a great experience seeing just from the past couple launches, just the shifts, just such small adjustments, but just well thought out. And 
I ran numbers. I think it was just like a couple of days ago. I'm really getting to look at everything and being like, wow, this, it works. If you just follow the numbers and just track your stuff in any way you can, it works. And you just got to find a bunch of really dope humans. Exactly. Yeah. And listen to your intuition as well. Like for a long time, I knew that this would probably be the most ideal way to mm. facilitate enrollment and facilitate my launch because I wanted it to be so authentic, guys. Like I, my brand, you guys know, I'm all about permission-based marketing and permission-based sales, which means that I want both people to be completely like, fuck yes, this mm-hmm. is the right choice. I just need to figure it out. Yeah. But having the wrong people represent that or having people in that role who weren't fully on board to that mission just felt so off for so long. Mm-hmm. And I'm so glad that we finally took action to initiate change in this mm-hmm. and it paid off big time. 100%. Another... Another great metric I would love to share, which is only trackable within you, but in the past launch, you as a visionary, you need to show up in your in your marketing, showing up, sharing information, really working and being that front face. And that's like, that's your zone of genius and where you need to be. Mm-hmm. And in previous launches, we've had, oh, you've had to even jump on sales calls mm-hmm. and like deal with customer service stuff. And there's so much that really drains that out of you if you're in a role like that. So I'd love to be able to share where you were like energetically on a scale, let's just say one to 10. Let's just talk about the last launch versus making these few changes in spaciousness with more support and how you felt this launch. Yes, let's do it. So the question would be, let's talk about like uh, stress. I think stress is a good factor, but like what was your stress like last launch one to 10? Yeah. So last launch was October of 2019. That launch, I always joke about it. I feel like it just about killed me, but like that was when I had my first panic attack and it wasn't necessarily about the business. It was just, I was feeling so overwhelmed with like all the, all the stuff that was relying on me. Mm -hmm. I didn't yet have like a really, really strong rock solid team. Mm -hmm. I just onboarded you. So you weren't really able to work your magic to the fullest extent back then. I was just managing. You were just managing the chaos basically. And we were doing broke to woke, which... (laughs) Whew, like I, I thought I was going to have more support and help and putting that on, but I ended up taking over a lot of it myself and me and Luke are kind yeah. of just wheeling and dealing all day, every day. Calls, oh, yeah. negotiating AV, trying to find banners. <laughs> yeah. Trying to find banners, trying to find freaking microphones, trying to find yeah. everything last minute because a lot fell through. But anyway, I was so overwhelmed and I think that my stress level, I honestly, I would rate it like an 11 out of 10 yeah. that entire month. I, I could feel it. Yeah. I was not doing well. Yeah. I was just like, how can I keep help? I, there's nothing else I can do. We just yeah. got to get through it. Every day, I remember you would ask me, is there anything I can do to support you? And I was like, yeah. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> yeah. like, unfortunately, there's so much that just rides on me right now. I just got to keep going. Yeah. Um, but having you like in that house when I was going through that was so like, I, yeah, because normally mm. I just do the stuff alone. Mm. Then this launch, yeah. <laughs> woo, oh, my chest feels lighter even talking about it. Yeah. This launch, I would say was probably... You know, being conservative, I'd say a two or a three in stress Mm. as opposed to an 11. Yeah. Um, The two and three, obviously, there's just a lot of urgency. And I was going, 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 going to events. I was Mm -hmm. managing the the OCA camp house, Mm -hmm. like facilitating everything. But it was so clear what my role was. And I was all I had to do all month was basically support the team, which is my zone of genius. I had to respond to DMs, do a lot of marketing on the Mm -hmm. front end, write emails, all that stuff, which is my zone of genius. And just that was it. Mm. I didn't have to do a single sales call except for one, but that was because I really wanted to. Yeah. And uh, that was it. So the beauty and what I wanted just uh, to bring that back to is just understanding, always ask the why. And I'm sure you have a lot of business owners, young entrepreneurs listening to this. Mm. And even if you're stuck in something, a few little changes that really don't even cut, that actually can save you money, can actually make your life way less stressful. Mm -hmm. And so to be constantly asking those whys and thinking about what shifts you can make, because Mm. how many more launches could you do with an 11 out of 10? Probably just one more. If I had to do that again, I probably would have lost a significant amount of passion for what I do. And I think that passion is something that doesn't have to do with your amount of attachment to what you love. Like, obviously Mm -hmm. I love OCA and I will always love OCA, but passion is something that comes and goes because the the definition of passion is an uncontrollable emotion. emotion. (laughs) You don't want that shit running your business. No, (laughs) Um, It's great to have that as fuel, but you can't rely on it for stability. So I think that the more I would burn myself out, the less service I would actually be giving to my students, which is my number one priority. It's my true North and my, my North on my compass every single day what's best for the student. Well, I've learned through 
failing and getting burnt out and getting stressed out that mm-hmm. that's not what's best for my student. Mm-hmm. I need to absolutely do less, mm-hmm. preserve my energy, restore my energy, give to my team on a deeper level, allow them to support the mission mm-hmm. as much as possible and lead that into a new future. That's the best way for me to lead and support my students. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, <laughs> yeah, I would love to dive into some like three bullet point mm-hmm. advice pieces from you and me, just from what we've experienced through for the launches. past. Yeah, for launches. Yeah. So I wanted to take a moment to give both of us kind of a, a little opportunity to share the top three lessons we've learned, maybe specifically from this launch, but any launch in general, mm-hmm. and what you guys can take away from this episode to make your launches significantly easier, more fluid, more smooth, and more profitable. Mm-hmm. All right. So my advice, I'll go and then I'll yeah, yeah. hand it over to you. Number one, team can make or break your success. So when it comes to onboarding team members, listen to your gut and only hire people who are ride or dies. And I didn't really know what that meant until I experienced that for the first time in the past few months. But I have team members who are just like, this is it. Get in the car. Don't ask mm-hmm. questions. Ride or die. Let's mm-hmm. go. Yeah. <laughs> that's like Nick's favorite. I was going to say, I was like, that's, that's Nick Reese. Yeah. <laughs> The second lesson is to be upfront about your sales process. So one Mm -hmm. of the things I think that works really, really well for me during launches is the fact that I'm really upfront about what the call is, what we're going to cover on the call, how to find out what the investment is. And I'm kind of addressing all of the objections on the front end of my marketing. And I'm saying, yo, this is the path in order to apply and to make this difference in your business. So go ahead and follow step one, two, three. Yes, you'll have questions on this. Yes, you'll be wondering how much it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, you'll be wondering if you have time. We'll cover all of that on the call. And it gives people a peace of mind that, oh, this call isn't just to sell me and to push me into something Mm -hmm. I don't want. It's to actually get clarity. And then the third lesson is don't overextend yourself, which means that you might have a goal in your launch. You might have a big, hairy, audacious goal. Is that what they call it? I think so. Yeah. That's really, really amazing. And I've had huge goals in my launches before. And what I keep coming back to is the fact that I always get exactly what I can handle. Mm. (laughs) And mastermind sometimes, uh, a lot of times what will come up is people say, I don't have enough clients. I don't have enough clients. I'm like, okay, great. So let me ask you this. If you got exactly what you wanted tomorrow and you had 50 clients sign up just like that, Would you actually be able to handle that? Yeah. Would you actually be able to deliver everything to the highest quality of what you can? And a lot of times the answer is honestly, no, I wouldn't be able to do that. It would be messy. It would take me too long. Things would break. And that's why I always come back to, yes, shoot high, but understand that wherever you land is exactly where you belong. Yeah. And that high there is like, is your, you have to set that metric and just like really understand. It's like, if we go above this, like. I don't like saying I get scared, but I remember looking at what we did last launches and this launches me like anything over this number here, I'm scared. So yeah. like, this is a hard cutoff. No more students. This is at least how I, f- my thoughts around it. Yeah. And then anything underneath that is great. Yep, exactly. Know yourself, know your capacity. And that's why we only take a limited amount of students mm-hmm. every round because we know our capacity. And just looking at the past two rounds and how much has changed. Just think about next round. Yeah. And that's, it's, there's so much beauty in just making shifts and getting it exactly right. So students get so much value. Everything is just so aligned and then scale it a little bit more. Yeah, exactly. All right. So three lessons about launches from Luke Fontaine. Oh, already. So I was funny. I thought you were going to say one and I was like, oh, she's definitely going to mention this one. And I was like, we're just going to be redundant, but you didn't. And it is health is number one. Mm. Know your boundaries, know your limits. And I've learned just from launching, got to keep that in check. Mm. Especially with me, I do 15 hour days, seven days a week, and I'm always on. And especially, I just need to always stay in check with that. So however you do that, whatever your rest method is and what really keeps you grounded, know to have that at forefront and to literally plant time in your schedule that's already blocked off for that launch for that activity or just time to decompress. Great point. So that's number one. Number two, I guess is like always ask why, never assume. Mm. So I can I can do this when I look at data and even when people are closing calls and I'm looking at numbers. For example, let's say someone has a really bad close rate and you could assume that they're just really bad and they're not just connecting or there could be a deeper thing that they may help with. Mm-hmm. And I remember things would come up like that and, oh my gosh, there's something I can support them with to help them. And they're going through something they didn't want to bring to the surface. 
So that would be my other thing with just teams is always ask why, never assume because you'll be there to support them. And it just comes back on the back end. Mm. So that's number two, if that counts, but that counts count. for me. And then number three, yeah, this is, it's very generalized and it's always hard for me to explain how I say this, but just every piece of data you can track. And this, I guess I'm just a nerd. So that's why this is very important to me, but whether it's, yeah, really even tracking emotional states, anything that you can put numbers in Airtable and anywhere and have that data, once we go to like the next launch, if we don't track it, then we we will never have it. Mm-hmm. So it's just like everything that you can figure out how to track length of calls, amount of call recordings, like anything around that, track it. You won't be sorry looking into the future when you need to make a strategic decision and you ha- you're able to look at that. When it comes to contractor time, even time I spend, I track every second of my time, even if I'm playing music, I'm tracking that. I'm everything I can do. So yeah. that's my third point. And can I add a fourth? Yeah. Can we say big? Explain oh, that one. yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so give context. So we were, we were up in, I think we were in Beverly Hills and I had, we were at this gathering of some really cool humans and it was a Stanford professor I connected with. And I forget where he heard it from or if it was his thing. I'm not sure, but he told me about big, B-I-G. And what that stands for is boundaries, integrity, generosity. And how those three things correlate together. And especially when you have a large team and you'll find me with my headphones on, on my laptop, just in a hole doing my thing. And energetically, uh, I want to be able to give to people and they're going to want to give to me and vice versa. And setting those clear boundaries, I can get sucked into doing a lot of things and just being present. And so what I learned was have to set boundaries with everyone, especially in something that's high volume. It's a month long. It's a lot of energy setting those clear boundaries Mm -hmm. so I can be in my own integrity. So then I can be generous with doing something for someone. Yes. So that, that nugget right there just shook me up this month and really has set me up. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that was absolutely life-changing for both of us because Mm -hmm. Luke and I are both, we were cut from the same cloth in that we don't have the same brains. Like he's systems and I'm Mm. different. (laughs) visionary creative (laughs) i'm not (laughs) um but we are both huge givers like we are always like what can we do for this person like how can we give to the we're always masterminding on how we can generously like just give an avalanche of love to people around us and it feels so good and at the same time what we typically notice about each other and ourselves is that wait why am i buying everyone in my life a massage, but Mm -hmm. I'm not even giving myself a massage or something like (laughs) that. And it was so funny to realize because I realized how true this is just in personal life and relationships, but also in your business. Guys, if you are a coach, you need to have boundaries with your clients. Mm -hmm. You need to tell them, this is what you can expect from me. These are the clear expectations, when I'm going to be responding, when Mm -hmm. things are going to come out, when this is going to happen, how to behave, how to reach out for help, how to do X, Y, Z, set all those boundaries. Then you act in integrity with those boundaries. And the other person understands how to act in integrity with those boundaries too. And I hear too many coaches complain, oh, my client hits me up at night, uh, right before bed. I'm like, well, did you tell them not to do that that, (laughs) or that you're only going to respond within these hours? And they're like, well, no. I'm like, well, how can they be in integrity with that? And then, you know, generosity on top of that. But if you're giving and you're generous first, you have no boundaries, no integrity. And what happens is you're so generous, but then you get into a pickle because you have to take away generosity and establish boundaries. So interesting. And it feels bad. Yeah. Yeah. So versus then like that one call where it's at 9am, they message you and they're having a meltdown and you do see it and you're like, you know what? I'm going to call them and they go, Oh, yeah. Oh my God. I got on a call after these hours and Mm. they showed up for me. And that just creates that that level of warmth and connection. Yeah. And you're Uh. able to give from a full cup, Mm -hmm. not from obligation because nobody really wants to be supported by someone who just feels like they have to support Mm -hmm. you. They want to be supported with generosity and you need to be in charge of that. So that was a huge framework that shook us up and we've been teaching it to everyone around us Mm -hmm. and, you know, big shouts to the Stanford professor and wherever he got that from, because it is absolutely a framework for a great life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (sighs) Yeah. I was going to share how you were really generous this launch, mm-hmm. but just because we were on that subject with Nick and the magic trick, 
Oh yeah. Oh my god. I just thought that was so special. Let's, let's share that. Yeah. And it was um through this launch, it was Valentine's Day weekend and mm-hmm. we set some pretty clear boundaries around the house, who can be in it, at what hours. Mm-hmm. They they have mandatory time off and obviously Valentine's Day was coming up and we posed it as like, hey, your spouses can fly in and do that, but it has to be outside space, taken care of, and we're just not involved with that stuff. That's yeah. extra curricular. We just wanted it to be a really safe space, a really mm-hmm. like zen home for everyone. Yeah. There's a lot of call volume. Obviously, we need to make sure that it's calm. So we set those parameters in place. And, and, and everyone's literally flying into the state and like it's not like they can just go to their home to have safe yeah. space. So we really needed to protect that. And we noticed that one of our team members' spouses wasn't flying in. I know he was very focused on the mission and what was happening, but that was like, since we set the boundaries and we were outside of this, we were like, you know what we could do? We could be really generous right now. Mm -hmm. And we did this craziest thing where we flew in Nick's spouse Mm -hmm. and he had no idea. We kept it a secret. Zero idea. (laughs) And something you'll learn about me guys is I'm obsessed with magic tricks. So if you see me in uh, real life, Please ask me for a magic trick because I like magic tricks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so creepy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love magic tricks. Yeah. And so I basically did a force card trick on Nick and we had hid Paula in the closet. Yeah. And forced a card onto him with her name written <laughs> on it. And he was just so confused. Yeah. So a little context on that. Everyone was like, we were, we've hosted like this couples mingling session. Mm -hmm. Everyone was like with their wife or their husband and the kids and like whatever and their little dog. And it was amazing. And then we're like, oh, Nick, Nick doesn't have his wifey. And like, we were all like, we'll be your Valentine, Nick. Mm -hmm. But she wasn't there. So it was like, oh man. So yeah, we arranged to fly her out. And she, the whole time was telling Nick this story about how she was in the Korean spa and she couldn't get to her phone and Mm -hmm. like making excuses and little white lies to cover up the fact that she was flying into San Diego. And then Luke comes up to me. He's like, I have an idea. He he puts her in like a closet area. Plenty of space. Don't worry. Plenty of air. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Not for very long, like maybe like three minutes max. And he puts her in there and then we bring everyone into the living room after she's hidden away. And then Luke performs this magic trick where everyone has to write down their spouse's name on a card mm-hmm. and spouse's name. Who's there? Who's there? So I wanted to like poke into that a little yeah, bit. Yeah. So Nick wasn't able to write down a name and then he shuffles the card and he needs a volunteer to draw the card. And Nick, of course, volunteers because he's always the first to be like, yeah. let's go. I'll do it. And Nick pulls out a card. And what does it say on the card? Paula. Paula, which is the name of his wife. Yeah. So then we're like, ooh, what's that mean? And then Luke opens up the closet. She busts it's out like, and it's like everyone's clapping and cheering. It was and it was so, so amazing. Sweet. Oh, and he had no idea. He was literally yeah. in shock. Yeah. I think like, that nugget right there was the best part of sales camp. Oh, I totally agree. I totally agree. I also think the best part of sales camp for me was... Uh, the last night that we were there, we went out to this. Well, first of all, we did breath work and then we mm-hmm. had like a bonding circle. And then we all went out to not all of us, but most of us went out to this place called Spin Nightclub mm-hmm. in San Diego. And literally only like two of us have ever been to a nightclub before in our lives. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like a very foreign environment. But I just got to watch everyone just let loose and dance their mm-hmm. asses off and just have so much fun. And I felt like I was literally with a group of my best friends and yeah. it was just so amazing. So Anyway, that is the recap of that's the, recap. the launch. It was a lot of fun, a lot of work and a lot of play. And we all made it out alive. Yeah. So that is a great success. Any last words to add, Luke, to the people? Thank you for having me on the podcast. You're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, more to come. I would love to have Luke on this podcast to dive deeper into how to set up your first systems and what systems Ooh. are important to set up in the beginning of your business. How long can you go on this thing? Uh, we'll wrap it up for this one and then we'll do another one for sure. But I would love to have Luke's input on how to start measuring data, especially if you're not like a data driven person right now, Mm. you need to have some way to adapt yourself into using these systems so that they can help you and not hurt you like they did to Mm -hmm. me. Please learn from my pain, not yours. (laughs) So Luke, thank you so much for being on. You're a treasure and just adore you. And thank you for being on my team and contributing to this mission. Thank you. And yeah, thank you guys. All right. Well, guys, if you like this, go follow Luke on the gram. It is Luke underscore Fontaine. Mm-hmm. He's a musician. He's an artist. He's creative. He's a data wizard. I was going to say data daddy, but data just- daddy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put that up. That'll be my like title name. <laughs> you need like a baseball cap that says data daddy. That's pretty cool. I'll get you one. Okay, cool. That's it for this episode, guys. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked it, then let us know. Reach out. And I'll see you next Friday for your next Payday with Ray Ray. 
I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did find it super valuable, you just want to share it with the world. Make sure you screenshot, post and tag me on Instagram so I can stock your profile and we can connect more. And to get notified on the next episode here on Payday, go ahead and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes so you never miss a beat. Get out there, secure the bag, and I will see you next Payday.